Hi, I'm uh, John Quadrino. I'm a senior security consultant with Optiv, and I'm going to discuss uh, deliberate engagements, uh, pulling from Air Force operations uh, battle rhythm, and applying that to penetration testing. So for the overview, we're going to discuss analogs of military operations to penetration testing engagements. We're going to discuss the uh, operational battle rhythm that the Air Force uses uh, for flyers, uh, uh, ground forces, uh, space operations, and cyberspace operations, which is the uh, plan, brief, execute, and debrief um, operational battle rhythm. We're going to apply this to individual pen testing just to uh, show ways that you could better improve uh, your uh, executing engagements, and then also applying PBED to penetration testing teams. So just a brief, who am I? I'm a uh, senior security consultant for Optiv and a uh, Air National Guardsman. Uh, I was with uh, the Kansas Air National Guard and then I took a little bit of time off and I'll be joining the uh, Pennsylvania Air National Guard. Uh, and then for my uh, operational background, I, I worked in cyberspace operations, uh, working in everything from uh, base communications to uh, actually running a weapons and tactics shop for a cyber protection team in Kansas. All right, so at this point, we'll talk about just a, a brief vignette. So having worked with the intelligence community and having worked in military operations, uh, I will not be providing a vignette for a uh, real world vignette, um, but I will uh, reference uh, a recent and very good film, uh, Top Gun Maverick. In this film, uh, there's a, a WMD facility that an adversary nation uh, you know, stands up and um, it's a threat to the US. And so what happens is, is they call um, Maverick back to uh, teach uh, Top Gun uh, graduates this mission. Uh, the mission is really to just destroy the WMD facility. The plan they come up with is that they're gonna get a recon on the environment, see if there's any, air, any enemy aircraft or if anything has tipped the hands of the adversary as to what they're gonna do. Uh, if, if it looks like it's favorable, they're going to follow through with the actual mission itself. And so uh, the mission really is, is it's really just uh, three things. Uh, one, Tomahawk missiles are going to take out the airstrip, the uh, adversary airstrip. Uh, and then F-18s are going to uh, fly through a very challenging terrain uh, below uh, trying not to get picked up by radar. And they're going to take out this WMD facility, which requires two strikes. And then from there, they're going to assess um, well, sorry, an assessment will be done to ensure that they achieve the objective and then they're supposed to uh, uh, head back home. And so through this example, uh, which has a lot of unrealistic aspects to it, however, um, it's a good example of some critical factors that need to be accounted for in military operations. And, and really, I view it as a justification as to why the Air Force is very deliberate in planning, briefing, executing and debriefing. Uh, and so those three factors that I want to hone in on that I think have parallels to penetration testing are going to be timeliness, integration, and constraints, restraints. So from a timeliness perspective, uh, I'm trying to, I, I think in the film, an AWACS is just keeping track of uh, really situational awareness of the airspace. And so from a timeliness perspective, if, if that AWACS didn't show up, then the entire mission could be late. Uh, another aspect for timeliness is is those Tomahawk missiles that end up taking out the airstrip. If the Tomahawks are too early, then that gives time for the adversary to react. And if there are any spare aircraft or any other capabilities, they could try and stand that up immediately. If the Tomahawks are late, then potentially the F-18s are rolling into uh, adversary environment, getting picked up. And then at that point, it's just going to turn into a, a dogfight and, you know, it would be much more challenging to achieve that military objective. When it comes to integration, that really comes down to deconfliction and communication. If the AWACS sees that the adversary environment is, is not good for the operation because there is an exercise going on and all the aircraft are in the air, that could jeopardize mission success. If the Tomahawks don't actually deconflict airspace with the F-18s or the AWACS, then potentially you could have friendly fire. Last, the last thing I want to touch on, constraints and restraints. Uh, in this military operation and all military operations, there's going to be rules of engagement depending on the environment. 
uh, depending on the adversary. And then also there's always going to be um, altitude limitations per aircraft, part of that deconfliction. So switching over to the penetration testing side, um, there are various penetration testing engagements that our team offers from your standard internal assessment, uh, perimeter assessment, uh, all the way through to more advanced offerings like purple and red teaming. Uh, for all of these engagements, especially if they're occurring at the same time against a client, you're gonna have the same critical factors that you need to account for. So from a timeliness perspective, um, you have to send start stop notifications. You, you need to let your client know that the actions they are authorizing are going to start so that they know that it's actually your team and not um, an actual adversary. Another issue with timeliness is you, um, you need to be aware of and respect maintenance windows. Um, if, if a client is going to do patching or take a screenshot of a certain environment, they're going to want everything stable to ensure that if something does go wrong, they can pinpoint it to, okay, well, this patch rollout didn't work out as well as we thought it would, or um, the environment didn't really integrate well with a particular thing we we're trying to push across the environment. Which brings us to our next point, integration. On the pen test team, you need to ensure that proper deconfliction and communication is going on. When it comes to password spraying, if you're password spraying on the from the perimeter to a cloud environment that's tied into Active Directory, while your internal team is also password spraying Active Directory, you're potentially gonna lock out thousands of users. Uh, and this is gonna be the same thing uh, for cloud testing as well. Uh, and then the last critical factor we wanna discuss is constraints and restraints. This is gonna sound a lot like rules of engagement. You have to stay within your scope. Uh, your scope is going to tell you, one, what are you authorized to do in that client environment? But then also, especially you know, when it comes to perimeters, your scope is going to ensure that you actually are working an engagement for your client and not another corporation. Uh, and then that also gets into your statement of work. So your statement of work is that rules of engagement aspect of you will do this, you will not do this. A client might not see value or, or might be very risk adverse to password spraying on Active Directory. A, a client may say, we have a cloud environment, but we don't want you testing that. So tying it all together, whether it's uh, military operations, uh, kinetic or non-kinetic, or penetration testing engagements, uh, all types of conflicts have uh, really the same critical factors that can affect achieving the end state. Uh, so, so we went over timeliness, integration, constraints, and restraints. Uh, for on the timeliness side, if you're uh, too early or too late with a strike package or uh, with particular um, an, a particular engagement type, that could affect the outcome of the engagement. Uh, on the integration side, if you don't uh, deconflict your actions, uh, if you have a lack of communication, then that could also lead to negative things as well. Uh, and, and on the other side of that, um, successfully deconflicting and communicating can ensure really the most effective employment of your forces, uh, whether it uh, be an internal and an external pen test working together, uh, or uh, you know Tomahawk missiles being integrated into an attack, uh, also using F-18s. Uh, and then lastly, we have constraints or strengths. Uh, this turns into really the same thing with deconfliction. And then overall, ensuring that uh, the right targets are hit with the right authorized effects. Hopefully that helps demonstrate the analog between military operations and penetration testing. They, they both prioritize the idea of timeliness, uh, the idea of integration, and then also on constraints and restraints. So with that in mind, now we'll do a, a brief overview of that Air Force uh, operational battle rhythm called Planning, Briefing, Executing, and Debriefing, or PBED for short. So for uh, Planning, Briefing, Executing, and Debriefing, um, in short, uh, planning is just solving the tactical problem. Briefing is synchronizing your teams through communication. So you wanna brief your team on what you're gonna do for that day or what you're gonna do for this period of time. 
executing, you're uh, observing, orienting, deciding, and acting, uh, which is called an OODA loop, but we'll, we'll go into that during execution. Uh, then lastly, debrief. You want to analyze what went well during execution, what went bad, and what went really bad. And so just to kind of orient you to this slide, because this is going to be a, this diagram on the right we're going to repeat, uh, it just shows those stages I spoke about. But something I do want to stress here is that the execution, this, this operational battle rhythm, if you will, does not stop at debrief. The, what you've determined went wrong and how you're going to fix it actually will feed planning. It'll feed your next plan. It's going to feed the next way that you do execution because generally from a debrief, you want to uh, provide tactics, techniques, and procedures to, to really um, ensure that you're being more effective in your next executions, your next engagements. All right, now we're going to hone in briefly on planning. Uh, so for planning, uh, the US Air Force uses this acronym ME3PC squared. And uh, what that does is it spells out a bunch of factors that need to be incorporated into solving the tactical problem. And so this could be things like mission, environment, enemies, effects, uh, contingencies, contracts, um, capabilities. And so what this is uh, trying to do is, is two things. One, what capabilities do you have? What is the objective you're trying to achieve? And then what are the what are the characteristics of your environments, of your adversary that you need to account for? Uh, this whole planning uh, acronym and this way of planning can be taught for, for months. Uh, it, it's complex. That is not the point of this discussion. Uh, this discussion is just going to be wave tops to kind of drive home some, some good points that'll help your pen testing. Uh, so I will not be touching on this. Um, but big picture, you want to solve the tactical problem. When an order comes down uh, from, from a, a, a commander, you want to be able to uh, distill down what is the objective you're trying to achieve, what is the commander's intent, um, and then really simplify it, divide it up, uh, and, and then and go solve it. Uh, and something important as well is, is that you want to build in assessment plans. Uh, really, the idea is, is that you want to give yourself the opportunity during a plan to pivot to a, a contingency in your plan. As an example, uh, I bring back in that, that Top Gun analogy. And so for uh, the mission objective in the case of that film, uh, and I just come up with like a, a quick and easy one, it, it's going to be um, on order. So when ordered, destroy the WMD facility so that future uranium enrichment is set back five years. Whether or not that's to the T, uh, whether on a military planning side or for that film itself, that's not the point, uh, just to give something concrete to chew on. And so the plan in this case, uh, if you're taking that, that seemingly abstract statement and you're distilling it into simpler objectives, it would turn into one, you wanna recon the environment. What does my environment look like? What threats are there? There's the threats that you're planning for, but then you need a snapshot in time right before you go out there to do your mission to make sure that things line up and things didn't change. Next, you want to disrupt your threat response, right? You want to ensure that either one, delay you getting detected or two, make it so that if you are detected, the adversary can't respond to impact your mission, uh, your mission objective completion. Uh, and then there's the, the meat and potatoes right there, the main one. I want to destroy this facility. That's the whole reason why you're going out there. Why am I reconning? Why am I disrupting threat response? So I can achieve my main objective, which is destroying the facility. Uh, and then you want to assess that destruction. Because if you don't destroy it, then maybe you could do another pass. Maybe you have another capability uh, available to you. What I'm showing here is, is that the original set of plan, uh, plan synopsis that we did earlier is actually very close to the plan that we came up with when we simplified off that main objective of recon, disrupt threat response, destroy the facility, and lastly, assess. And what you'll find is with military planning is that they generally will follow uh, that kind of model of one, let me recon, two, uh, you know, let's 
strike and then lastly let's reassess the strike to see if we have to go again having uh solved that tactical problem and, and simplified and broken out a plan next is briefing uh so for, for the the briefing phase of the operational uh battle rhythm if you will is uh you want to synchronize your teams the whole point of briefing is not to make a, a meeting up it, it's really going to come to two things one if you're not authorized to do this action, you want to get authorized to do it. Uh, you know, in the military, we call it the game plan. Um, I think it's the game plan approval meeting. And so you want your cyber boss or your air boss to actually uh, authorize you to, to execute your plan. The second thing is really to communicate and synchronize your team. And so for uh, do it uh, here, you want to communicate the black line plan. The black line plan, all that means is, is that uh, this is the everything goes perfect plan that we are going to achieve. Uh, now, if you deviate from that main black line and you start going into like a branch, um, at that point, you do want to also discuss contingencies. At what point would you assess that you need to pivot off that main plan? And what does that look like? How would that get communicated? Who would be the one, uh, you know, I guess, making that call? Uh, and so that, that lines up with this idea of the communications contract. All that is is a listing of what event would trigger a certain communication. What does that communication look like and whose call is it to make it? Again, you want to get approval. That's why you give a briefing if needed. And then two, instruct your team what they need to do, who's doing what, at what times, and um, what the contingencies could potentially look like. Next, we get into executing the plan. And so uh, for executing the plan, I do highlight this idea of the OODA loop or the observe, orient, decide, act uh, concept, which is shown in that picture below. Um, it, it was this uh, methodology put forward by John Boyd, who's, who's a, like a military strategy tactics uh, visionary. And um, the idea here is, is that your ability to execute an OODA loop quicker than your adversary would determine the outcome of uh, a skirmish, a battle, a war. And, and so the idea being is, is that if you can observe, you know, what the adversary is doing and then orient yourself to it, make the correct decision and act quicker than they could, you would effectively win. This bleeds into this idea of situational awareness, but during the idea is during execution, you're not just executing the plan in a vacuum. You have to you have to account for what the adversary is doing, and you have to pivot and change your plan, but still try to stick to the plan. If if you do break off, so one, you can't execute in a vacuum, but then two, if you are executing. Uh, autonomous from each other, then you run into potential issues. Also, you're just not going to be as effective. All right. So once you're done executing at that point, you do get into that debrief phase. And so here, what you're looking for is, is one, how did you do? Were you effective? Did you achieve the military? Uh, sorry, did you achieve your mission objective? It's at this point, you want to find your failures, find the root cause to that failure, fix it, document it, and then that is going to feed future training, future tactics, techniques, and procedures so that you as an operator, your team as an operational team uh, can learn from it and ensure that the next cycle that comes up of planning, briefing, executing, and debriefing is that much better. All right, briefly, I, I am gonna dive a little bit deeper into debriefing. Uh, debriefing is an art and not a science. Uh, you, you can't just, uh, you know, take certain factors and punch it into an equation and expect a certain output. Uh, just as there are multiple types of, of arts, uh, if you will, uh, debriefing, there's multiple methods. There's the Ishiwaka uh, diagram, uh, and then there's your more traditional uh, Air Force debrief. And even that, there's different styles depending on how comfortable you are. Um, but overall, big picture, when it comes to debriefing, you want to recreate events that occurred. You want a timeline of, of really what occurred during that execution window. Uh, and then you want from that, you want to break out factors that uh, affected the execution. 
Uh, and then from there, once you have multiple contributing factors to potentially a failed outcome, you want to isolate the root cause. Uh, and then finally, uh, when you've isolated that root cause, you want to fix it in a smart way. And by smart, um, I mean uh, specific, measurable, attainable, repeatable, and uh, timely. The, the point there is, is that you want to fix action to be concrete uh, with steps so that um, it's not something that is either too abstract or too vague. When it comes to uh, isolating the root cause, uh, there is some uh, an advanced method I learned in, in uh, weapon school uh, that I find very neat. So I'll briefly jump into that. Uh, so when you isolate the root cause or that that uh, that factor that really is that the last uh, causal link uh, as to why you ultimately went down the end state that you went down. Uh, so root cause really being that last action that took you your uh, your engagement off the rails. A root cause can really have three types. There's perception, decision, and execution. So what that means is depending on the type of root cause you has you have, that's also going to inform the root cause uh, how to fix it. Uh, but just briefly going into it, uh, a perception root cause error is that you don't have the right data in order to make a decision and to execute. And so a fixed action for that might be to ensure you have all the data. Uh, when it comes to decisions, the assumption here is that you had all the right data, you just made the wrong decision. Uh, and, and so the fixed action here might be making a decision matrix to assist you to, to really uh, ensure you're looking at all the data as you should look at it to always come up with that correct decision, even though it might be complex with a lot of moving parts. Um, and then finally, there's an execution error uh, root cause. And so in this case, you had all the correct data, you were in the right position to get that data, you made the right decision, you just executed poorly. And so, you know, using an example, uh, you know, from, from earlier, uh, if you were the F-18 pilot and you were supposed to take out that WMD facility and you actually, you got through the entire gauntlet, uh, you got to that WMD facility, and it turns out that there were two, you know, Death Star style uh, vaults to send your ordinance into. If, if you, you know, perceived one of them versus the other uh, incorrectly, or if you needed more data and you needed to really fly over and get closer, that could have been a perception error. Um, if it turns out that uh, you actually had a bunch of data and you were in the right position and it says something along the lines of, uh, you know, this aperture will be larger in diameter compared to the other one and you just made the wrong decision, that could be a decision error. And then finally, if you did pick to send your ordinates down the correct aperture, but your hand just slipped, <laughs> right? Or uh, you didn't really know how to send that particular ordinance, that would be the um, execution uh, error. So having done a brief overview of PBED, now we're going to look into how apply that to individual pen testers to better their engagements. When it comes to planning as a pen tester, you need to define your mission objective. Uh, if a client is saying you need to do a segmentation test, it's not that simple. You need to ask, you know, where is my non-card development environment? Where is my card development environment? Do you want me to test from multiple non-card development environments? Is, is, are the segments different? Um, so you have to define that objective. Something as easy as a segmentation test or as complex as a red team, you need to spell out what is the client looking for. Um, in addition uh, to that, you need to read up on Intel. And so Intel really is gonna come into two things. There's the Intel that you think about of what adversaries are out there for this particular client type, for this particular industry. And what are some indicators of compromise? What is their intent? But then there's that other type of Intel, which is not really purely Intel, but it's more so, I call it operational context. What does this client looking to gain out of this that is unique to this client? Or what is it that this client wants that makes it unique and not just a generic penetration test? When it comes to planning, 
although I went through a very deliberate ME three PC squared overview and um, that might not be appropriate for your regular penetration test engagement. However, I think the penetration testing version of that is having deliberate and personalized TTPs and pasteables ready. You don't want to go into an engagement and pull up a blog on, uh, you know, insert your TTP where they're using a tool that you're not as familiar with on an operating system you don't normally engage from. Have your TTPs ready, have your pasteables ready with your notes in your note taker, whether it's Obsidian or Notion or whatever it is you use or, or OneNote. Uh, during your plan, you want to define your scope and define your exempt hosts. You might have your statement of work, which might be a little bit generic. You might have your scope, which is, uh, you know, a bunch of ciders, but it's worth asking the client, is there any servers or hosts that might be a little bit more critical or high traffic that you don't want me to do the full engagement on potentially, or you want to limit uh, to certain time windows? Uh, another piece of the planning is just have your notifications ready. If you're going to send start stops, have those ready during the planning stage because you should be able to move forward with who your points of contact are, etc. And lastly, plan integration with teammates. Multiple times on the Optive team, uh, myself or an another teammate I've been working with, we've reached back and forth to each other and said, hey, you know, for this, I'm going to do password spraying up front you know, does that work with you? Are you tracking that? And, and that allows us to de-conflict and ensure we're not blocking out accounts and stepping on each other's toes or the client's toes for that matter. Next, we move into briefing. And, and so uh, for, for this piece, you just want to listen for context. If you're meeting with your client, be an active listener and, and kind of get more context out of your client. They're not just asking you for a pen test for compliance sake. Sometimes they do but maybe they're onboarding a new capability. You know, maybe it is for compliance, but the last test they got was from a different team and they weren't pleased with how, how big they were. Uh, this is an opportunity to communicate your methodology. It's, it's really briefing your generic plan. What does your team normally do so that your client can be aware that as the SOC is giving them feedback, they know that it generally fits your, your methodology. And so, um, essentially some validation for them that it is your actions. Uh, and then lastly, communicate that uh, communications plan. And so in the case of a critical finding or in the case of if the client th thinks there's an outage related to your actions, go through what your normal processes are to ensure that um, communications can be quick and effective. Next, we get into the execution piece. Um, I already mentioned the whole execute your TTPs. At this point, you want to make sure uh, in execution, you're tracking your progress. So if you have a methodology, make sure you're, you're following your methodology. Um, there's a lot of good certifications out there. And then of course, there's a lot of real world experience out there where you have a large scope and a lot of services, a lot of ports. You have to keep track of that because what you don't want to do is, is drill down deep and you know one service could potentially highlight uh, an initial access method via another service but you're not keeping track of what you did and did not look at for either one host or multiple hosts so that gets into documenting as you go uh, and then you know pivot to different pieces of your methodology as needed but make sure you're thorough and come back as well lastly you get into that debrief phase and so for as an individual pen tester uh, there's really there's there's two types of debriefs. Um, one, you're debriefing your client. It's not the the strict debrief that you would think of for military operations, but more so you're letting them know how did they do? What did your assessment of their environment? What did your engagement in their environment reveal? And how do they fix it? Uh, but when I mention debrief, I more so mean debriefing for yourself. How did you do? What were you trying to do? And how did you do? Uh, it, it gets into reviewing your TTPs. Maybe you thought your TTPs were ironclad. You tested them in your environment. They were hardened after using them in multiple adversary environments, uh, but you fell short. And so, you know, an example I have for that is, is I, I really do enjoy running eyewitness, especially when we're doing a comprehensives. Uh, it's just, it's easy to use eyewitness to open up a bunch of, uh, web portals, web pages, instead of going manually through each one. However, 
um, it's important to know what each flag means and potential shortcomings. And so I was feeding an nmap XML file and I was missing out on some potential uh, subdomains and virtual hosts because I was uh, pretty much just running at witness on IPs. And so know how you can tailor your TTPs. Maybe you take a manual list of host names and IPs and then run it against eyewitness instead of just relying on a flag that may or may not work. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, a big piece of debriefing is your objective is, is really always going to be to consult. It's not just to get domain administrator, right? When it comes to um, this reviewing mitigation recommendations, uh, the point is, is that your mission objective should not be, I will get domain administrator. It's more so I will consult. So I will execute what's available to me and I, and I will, uh, you know, get initial access. I will privesque where I can, but then I'm going to tell the appropriate story effectively so that the clients can actually mitigate and remediate vulnerabilities that I found. So that's definitely an important piece to hone in on on the debrief side. So having discussed um, how you can apply PBED to being an individual penetration tester, this next portion is how can you promote a culture of PBED? So this is probably more tailored toward team leads, but it's how do you implement PBED for pen tester teams? How do you cultivate a culture of deliberate operations for your pen tester team? It's important to note uh, for this section, I will highlight practices that Optiv that we use on our team. Uh, and so, you know, there will be times where I go on a little anecdote and say, you know, Optiv uses this here. All right. So for the planning portion of the cycle, uh, it's important to prepare mission objectives per offering. Uh, it's important to prepare methodologies and TTPs per offering. Unless your team only does like one-off extreme offerings, you know, I suspect you'll generally come across the same offerings, right? So if you, if, uh, for example, uh, it's like having a set of statement of works that you generally will provide or a set of offerings that you provide. All right, for the planning portion of PBED, um, what you want your team to do is to prepare mission objectives per offering. You want offerings to be standardized so that your consultants can train towards them and perfect their TTPs towards that offering. Uh, part of that is having a TTP repository uh, that allows uh, individuals to um, on your team to one, you know, standardize TTP so that if something doesn't work, they could help each other out. But then uh, two, it allows uh, fellow operators to actually validate and improve TTPs. Uh, also of importance, uh, just to having Intel products. Um, which has some requirements to it. If you're going to have Intel products, you need people with an Intel background. You need Intel teammates. Um, and so, you know, an example for this is uh, I was working a, a, uh, a very timely um, and exciting engagement um, with, with a power company. And um, at the end, so to hammer home this idea of having Intel processes in place, um, I'll, I'll just do a little brief vignette. I, um, I had the uh, really the awesome privilege um, it, to, to work with a power company in a very timely, uh, a very timely engagement. And, uh, so to hammer home this, this point of having Intel products, uh, for your team, uh, I, I do bring up this brief vignette. So in 2022, I had the pleasure and privilege really of working with a power company. And the reason why I bring this up is, is during that time, it, it was, you know, open source knowledge that Russia was, um, targeting, uh, the energy sector and, um, in, in, you know, in across the, the U S um, and across Europe as well. At the end of the engagement, I think it was during the after action review call, the, my, my point of contact asked me, is like, Hey, so, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on, you know, how realistic is it that these vulnerabilities, uh, you know, could, could be exploited. And uh, I had to pause on this one because uh, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, as consultants, we really want to know our TTPs well. Uh, but when somebody asks really essentially like, what's the risk to, to my particular environment? I, I, I had to, you know, kind of hit the brakes there. So, so my response was really to kind of treat the vulnerabilities in a threat agnostic way. Don't look at it from the perspective of what a threat could go after. 
more so prioritize based on what could lead to the worst things. Uh, but looking back, if you could bring that threat intel piece in, sure, you do want to prioritize based on what could be the worst for your environment, but then also you could actually account for what's the worst for your industry. So, But that's only possible if you have the Intel processes and Intel team in place to let you know that a particular APT at this time is actually going to focus on your industry and that, you know, maybe hardening here, here, and here might be the best way forward. When it comes to promoting briefing for a pen testing team, uh, really the best thing you could do is, is implement a standardized battle rhythm. And so at Optiv, uh, before engagement, we have two kickoffs. We have an internal kickoff and an external kickoff. And so that internal kickoff is really helpful because it gives you that context of um, from our internal perspective, what the client is going to want and what their background is and, and you know where they kind of see themselves going with this particular assessment. Um, this kind of gets at what I was saying earlier about operational context. Um, and then the external kickoff, it's, it's really good to just hear it directly from the client's mouth like what what are they looking for why are you asking for this engagement uh some clients will come back and say uh compliance or they won't say compliance but you'll hear you know you'll hear in between the lines it's for compliance but a lot of the times you'll actually hear from a client that they're integrating a new capability they're onboarding something new uh or they're you know they're concerned because they're um, acquiring another firm and they want to make sure that everything's lined up uh, and then during the actual engagement itself uh, having uh, standardized inner team communications uh, you know what pocs how you're going to work with your pms how you're going to work with demand and delivery how would you work with fellow operators is it teams is it keybase is it slack or anything like that um, and then post engagement what does that normally look like and promoting it as well by standardizing these things and making a battle rhythm, you're allowing your operators to have a culture and to uh, really uh, succeed. All right, next you get into um, executing the plan. And so for when it comes to the OODA loop aspect, you really just wanna promote um, your team's best practices by having a documented uh, TTP repository. Um, also, uh, you wanna track progress. So you want to hopefully, if you can, standardize uh, reporting tools uh, and, and practices. So lastly, that brings us to uh, implementing debriefing on your pen test team. Um, in, in this case, you need to promote the analysis of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and then what are you going to do with that information? Well, you feed it into a TTP repository. And so that doesn't mean necessarily... So I think something of importance here uh, that we do at Optiv is we promote the sharing of wins, losses, and TTPs through a bi-weekly attack and pen sync up. And so uh, during this talk, we'll have a, a, a consultant uh, towards the end of the, you know, we'll have that normal meeting where you go over admin that needs to, you need to discuss. You'll maybe introduce a new team member or uh, what is it, hail and farewell type meeting, right? But then at the end, we open up the meeting for a consultant to um, to share a win or a loss or a new TTP or, or a new tool. And, and so this is this is very helpful because you're really creating a culture, a consultant culture, right? And so that, that's actually why in this picture, I include the uh, Brazilian World Cup championship team um, from the 70s. Uh, this is deviating from the, the military operations piece, but why do I include that? When you analyze your mistakes, when you build out your TTPs and you inform each other on your team, you inform yourself. When you promote your um, your wins, when you promote your losses and you promote accountability, you allow yourself to be rock stars, right? You allow yourself to have your own style of engagements. You allow yourself to uh, really internal to your team to kind of be like this this Brazilian soccer team was where you, you have your own flair, your own style, your jogo bonita, right? So you promote this culture of like people nerding it out and, and, and wanting to share with each other and really lift the bar up for everybody else. All right, so uh, for Source ZeroCon, uh, you know, th this talk is pre-recorded, um, but hit myself up or a teammate up on Discord and I'll gladly engage on military operations um, or any, if you disagree with something, uh, <laughs> 
or, or if you have any other cool uh, vignettes to share uh, when it comes to uh, taking this process and implementing it as an individual pen tester. I didn't mention it, but maybe as a thread hunter um, or successes or failures you've had in implementing this on a team. All right, so as a summary, um, we spoke about the uh, relationship of military operations and penetration testing engagements to show um, that deliberate operations are necessary and good. Uh, we talked about uh, an overview of PBED, uh, and then we applied that to individual pen testing, and we applied it to um, penetration testing teams and how you could promote that culture, that operational battle with them on your, your pen testing team for deliberate operations. All right, well, uh, thanks for your time, and uh, I hope you tune into uh, some, some awesome uh, further Source ZeroCon talks, and I hope to be in touch if you're uh, interested in chatting on any of this.